Welcome to this playlist that's on the shallow recurrent decoder networks, so what we call SHRED. This is an overview, first introduction to this talk, and there's a series of lectures outlining the power and the capability of this very flexible framework for essentially uh, pr understanding spatial temporal data. It's a decoding only strategy using neural networks. And I'll walk through some of the basic ideas of it and why it uh, works so well. It's rooted in theoretical ideas and concepts that we use all of the time and I want to illustrate some of those here and which will underpin some of the theory of why this works uh, in so many diverse problems that we're going to be illustrating in a set of lectures that will follow. So first of all the shallow recurrent decoder network is something like this here. So what you're seeing here is sort of the basic architecture. I'm going to measure a system, spatial temporal data, and so I can organize my data in terms of a data matrix, which would have uh, the columns as times and the rows or the state space. So here is a PDE, for instance, where I'm going to measure in a few locations. So one way to think about this is a mapping from these sensor locations denoted in red, and these are called S. So I'm going to take three sensor, for instance, locations, and I'm going to take their time sequence and run it through a, a sequential model, and here represented by an LSTM, for instance. But you can trade the sequence model out to a transformer, a, a GRU network, or some recurrent neural network. The main thing is that this is a, essentially a time pipe that learns a latent representation of the sequence itself, which then is fed in to a decoder network, which maps back to the full state space. So this is the spatial component. So what I have here is the temporal sequence that then maps back out to the full high dimensional state space. In many ways, when you look at this architecture, I've separated time and space. And so this is very much a generalization, of the concept of separation of variables, which is one of the standard techniques for solving partial differential equations. And I'm going to show you that's kind of the underlying theory of how the shred architecture works. It is a generalization of separation of variables solutions for PDEs. So in practice, this is the actual architecture itself here. I've represented it as a set of neural networks. You have a decoder network, which is basically uh, a set of feed-forward neural network layers. Uh, and it's shallow in the sense that we do not have very many layers here, but it's a mapping from the latent space of this time sequence models to the full state space. And then here, this is some kind of recurrent neural network. In other words, building a sequence model for the temporal evolution of what the sensors are measuring in the system. So this mapping is a decoding only strategy. And the decoding only is actually very powerful because normally when you try to create inverse pairs, so for instance if you were to come in here and try to auto encode and then decode, you are by construction creating a uh, uh, an inverse pairing, so uh, an encoding and a decoding which kind of are inverses of each other. And we know that creating it even for a matrix, if you try to compute its inverse, it's a pretty unstable uh, numerical operations uh, that it's so, you know, right, it's numerically stiff to do this, especially for large scale systems. And so here, the decoding only strategy completely circumvents this creation of inverse pairs that we have, which make it numerically very stiff to train. Okay, So that is one of the advantages, and it relies on simply this separation of variable idea, which is break up time and space uh, directly. Now why is this important? Well, let me go back to classic techniques for solving spatial temporal systems. And specifically, let's look at the underlying theory that we'd learn very early on for linear PDEs. So in a first course in partial differential equations, you might consider something like this, a linear PDE where L is an operator here, which is some operator that you might want to do, which typical examples might include things like the one-way wave equation, heat equation, or Schrodinger equation. So these are very standard things for us to look at. In fact, my first course in PDEs, the first day of class, we considered the heat equation. And the first thing we did to try to arrive at a representation of the solution was to do separation of variables. The first technique to try was to say, my solution is a product of a space function and a time function. Now this is a very general concept and applies broadly across PDEs and in fact it was one of the earliest ways we learned how to solve PDEs to begin with and it's 
essentially the the basics and the beginning of a, of a of an introductory PDE course. Now, once you actually put in this form of solution, what you end up with is an eigenvalue problem for that operator L, which specifies the physics of the system. And in fact, you get an eigenvalue problem like this. And a lot of your effort that is spent trying to find eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of the system represented here. And with that, we can construct the general solution. So once you have these eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, then the general solution looks just like this. And in fact, for that linear operator, if you can find the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, then you can represent all possible solutions are given by this. Okay? So notice at this point, we don't have a unique solution because we haven't specified, for instance, the initial condition. And that's the step that normally takes place next. This is all possible solutions. To get the unique solution I want, what we do is we impose, at say time t equals zero, an initial condition. In other words, at time t equals zero, we know the entire state of the system. Now, let's suspend our belief for a minute to think that this is actually possible. In many physical systems, that's not what happens. However, this is how we seed our numerical simulations uh, as well as how we normally solve these. So once we specify the initial condition, the B of n, which we did not know, are now specified as an inner product between the initial condition, u0, and each of the eigenfunctions. So now, in typical you know, linear PDE theory, what we have is a unique solution by solving the initial boundary value problem. What we needed to do is go from all possible solutions to the unique solution by getting the values of B of n, and we did that with the initial condition. So this is a standard technique in every undergraduate PDE textbook and even graduate PDE textbook. This is how we typically start solution techniques here. But I'm going to present to you an alternative. Our objective was to determine these B events. That's how we get a unique solution. So I'm going to talk about what we might call the sensory boundary value problem. And this is an alternative way to formulate the problem. What I'm going to do instead is, what if I had one location, for instance, let's call it x of s. And at x of s, at this location, I have a sequence of measurements in time. So in other words, at each measurement location, I, have, I can evaluate the eigenfunction at that location and its time behavior at that location. And so I have a data, and I'm, I've taken a measurement here, so I have some data point there that has a constraint. Now, if I'm doing an n mode expansion of my eigenfunction expansion, then if I have n time point measurements at this one location, what it does is it creates an n by n system of equations for solving for the B of n. So this is an alternative way to get the B of n, is by specifying at one location, at a couple locations, a sequence of measurements in time, which is equivalent to specifying the initial conditions. Okay, So that's how we would do this. In fact, once I construct these B events from these sequences, I could, in fact, even just say, I'll tell you what the initial condition was everywhere by putting t equals 0 into this thing. So this is an alternative to this. It's kind of obvious you can do this. And yet we typically don't teach any of this in of our textbooks. But that is exactly what this shred architecture is relying on to be so effective in modeling spatial temporal systems. So just as a, as a very specific graph, suppose I'm solving a 2D PDE on a grid. Normally, we grid it up. And, and for me to solve this, I'd have to actually know the solution at every single position on this grid. That's the initial condition. But what I'm going to do in this methodology is you're trading time and space. So instead of knowing everything at one, at one time, everything spatially, I'm instead going to trade that out for at one time position in space, I know some temporal evolution. I have some measurements. So the measurements are these, the dots there is maybe where I took a measurement, which means I have a constraint on those B of n's. And in fact, if I have n of them and I'm having n mode expansion, then that allows me then to go after getting the n by n system solved to get the B of n. So that's how this works. And it's exactly what the shred model is, is essentially this model here. You trade, I take a temporal sequence, I'm going to map it to the full state space. Okay. And by the way, we, uh, this, although I've shown this for 
linear PDEs where you can work everything out explicitly, it's really the basis of solving many nonlinear PDEs. So let's take a nonlinear PDE here and let's take, for instance, a spectral method solution where you have a set of basis functions, spectral methods. You might use Chebyshev polynomials, Fourier, po uh, Fourier, Fourier representation uh, for a spectral method. And the idea is then is to get ODEs for each of the coefficients, how they evolve in time. And so it's your, you're right back to the same idea, which is essentially this is a time-space separation. And my goal then is to uniquely determine the dynamical system or the ODEs for B of N. And if it's an n-dimensional system, it means I need, typically we impose an initial condition to get those, but I could also exp impose a series of measurements at a limited number of positions but that would also allow me to get the initial conditions for the B of N themselves. So I can again trade time and space just like I did previously. You can also think about doing weekly nonlinear PDEs by doing perturbation expansions. Since I showed you can work it out completely for a linear model, then what this would allow you to do, if I have small perturbations, I could just perturbatively ex and explicitly represent the shred solution in this architecture. So that's the underlying idea. It is based on a very simple concept, which is sim simply separation of variables. Now let me approach this problem that we're looking at from a completely different viewpoint, which is from the sensor problem viewpoint. So there's an entire mathematical formulation of what we call the sensing problem, which is essentially trying to create a map from my sensor measurements to the full state space. So this is how it's represented in practice. You have a state space, which is typically high dimensional, and you have a number of measurements in that system, point measurements, let's say, and you have P of them. And P, typically P is very small compared to the state space. So and we, when we look at large spatial temporal systems, I have a limited number of sensors, and so maybe I have just a small number of sensors in the system, but I'm trying to reconstruct the entire state space. So the sensing problem is formulated very simply. It says, how do I find a map, let's call it F, that goes from sensors to some approximation to the full state space. And of course, what I'd like to do is make this a very good approximation. And you can do that through optimization. And here's the optimization framework. Find this model F that maps the sensor measurements to the full state space. So this is an approximation to the full state space. This is the state space, and you try to minimize that difference. So this is very classical sensor problem formulation. And so this is what we're going to do for this optimization. And there's a lot of techniques to do this, which I won't talk about here. But the sensor problem can, for instance, be done even with linear maps using the SVD. And so there's a lot of uh, methods built around that, which provides actually a really uh, simple approximation. And oftentimes, it's quite a good approximation. But we want to build on it and make it even better. Now, this optimization problem, the way it's formula here in the sensor problem, oftentimes now is called operator learning, right? So we do see a movement towards basically framing this and coming up with different architectures here for this model F of mapping a small number of points to the full state space, you know, is things that, for instance, you do in, in PINs, DEPO, FNO, some of these modern architectures that people are now using uh, in machine learning to make this mapping, okay? But I want to approach this differently in the sense that Although this is the classical sensor problem, problem, the most obvious thing to do for the sensor problem is to, in fact, make better use of your sensors. And what do I mean by that? Your sensors are recording from the system. Make use of their time history. This is an inverse problem. It is a map from a small amount of measurements to the high dimensional state space. And you're taking this current sensor measurements to do it. That's typically how this is framed. But in fact, it's a spatial temporal system which means it's evolving in time, which means you could actually take the time history of these sensors and map the time histories to the high dimensional state space. This massively constrains the inversion of the problem. And in fact, it does so so much that now training a model to do this is quite easy. That's exactly what the shred architecture does. It's just this idea here. But now, instead of having access just to the current measurements, <coughs> I have measurements to a time history of these. Okay? And really what it's happening here is we're taking advantage of the Tawkins embedding theorem. So this goes back to 1981, which says something very important. It says if I measure one of your variables, I'll just say this in English, there's more precise ways to do this and it will be in following lectures on this uh, on this playlist.
But if I take a measurement of one of your components of your n-dimensional system, and if I time delay embed that, then what I have, that time delay embedding, is diffeomorphic to the full dimensional, uh, for the high dimensional state space. Now the problem with the diffeomorphism, it isn't exactly this, the physics. But in the training procedure that we do here with SHRED, we know that if I take a small number of measurements and I take their time history, essentially the LSTM or whatever recurrent neural net is going to build essentially a time delayed representation of this which has information about the full state space. And to make it unique to that full state space and not just diffeomorphic to it, I have a training data set and that pins it down to the uniqueness that I need. So that's the underlying theoretical concepts here. Very simple. Separation of variables, Tocchin's embedding theorem. They hold up this entire shred architecture and they are the uh, the reason, sort of the theoretical basis of why it works so well. The other thing I'll point out, it's a decoding only strategy. And this has significant advantage because there's almost no hyperparameter tuning that needs to be done to make this work. Uh, and in fact, the training itself is very fast. And we'll see we can even contrain, contrain uh, in compressive fashion. So in the following lectures, you'll see everything is actually very lightweight, reproducible, all the code that and data that we've used will be available to you to train this model. So it's very simple uh, and there's no hyperparameter tuning essentially which means even if you have the code for your data you'd have to be hyperparameter tuning for quite a long time, you know, weeks, months. This is essentially out of the box. It usually is working quite well and many of the examples you're going to see uh, there was no hyperparameter tuning required. And I think largely that's because of this decoding on the strategy using these two basic ideas of uh, separation of variables, Tocchin's embedding theorem. Um, so all the code again is there, the data is there for reproducibility so you can run these things. And again I'll just highlight that separation of variables is what we've been doing for a very long time. So it's not that we're coming up with some a very exotic idea, it's just basically from the first day of PDE theory class, this is what you would do. This is also what we do in numerical schemes like spectral methods. We explicitly separate time and space. We also do this in a singular value decomposition when we look at low rank dynamics, for instance, maybe you want to call this POD instead of SVD. We would take data, we'd collapse it down into some low rank representation. U is the space, V is time. So that is explicit time space separation. Dynamic mode decomposition does the same thing. It basically breaks it up into a space component or DMD mode and the DMD eigenvalues are sitting over here which carry the time dynamics. And Shredders is just a generalization of this into essentially a time pipe and a spatial pipe and we compose them together. So the latent space of this time sequence model goes right into the decoder and it's basically a generalization of a separation of variables. And this is exactly why it is so successful. So as you, as you watch the following lectures uh, put together by a great team of, uh, of students here, what you'll see is there's um, applications and development of the theory, uh, especially towards uh, bringing it into reduction to practice. Again, all the code is available, all the papers will be referenced on the, on the playlist site. So you can download this and run everything. Everything will run kind of as advertised as what you see here. Uh, so hopefully you will enjoy watching these lectures on Shred.